Okay, so this is not only going to inspire our EITs who are right here in front of us right now. All of them couldn't make it, but they're going to get to watch it later on their online training. So thank you so much for saying yes and being willing to be a contributor. Absolutely. Okay, so this is my favorite first question. Will you please brag shamelessly about yourself? And I have your bio right in front of me, so if you don't do a good job of it, I will chime in because sometimes this is hard for people. Right, right, right. Well, um, my name is Phil. Uh, I'm, I consider myself to be an entrepreneur, which is why I want to come and speak to everybody because I'm a huge fan of, of Defy and what you're doing. And um, I like to, you know, volunteer in the community, spend my time um, talking about some things that I know and try to help people. So this was a perfect opportunity. Thanks, for, thanks again for inviting me. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, uh, I'm a venture capitalist. Um, I work here in San Francisco. and. Name a uh, firm. My name, I'll hit some of the bio points. Um, I work at IDG Ventures. I'm a managing director. And um, we currently have a $100 million fund. And I look for entrepreneurs. <laughs> <laughs> That's a million dollars. <laughs> um, and I look for entrepreneurs that have a great idea in technology, um, mostly in consumer internet, in some enterprise companies. And we fund them. And hopefully these companies become really large. I work with those companies closely, work with the entrepreneurs closely, sit on the boards, and hopefully they become large companies. And, and, um, and I've, I've invested in some big companies in the past and some companies on there um, that you may know. Uh, Pandora was one that, that we did Woo! early on. Um, yeah. Very small, only um, 10 people in uh, Berkeley. And they had a very different vision at the time. We worked closely with them, and, and they are the multi-billion dollar company that we all love today. Um, and also a lot of other companies. I do, um, I love investing in companies, investing in entrepreneurs, but I also love the, the genres of music, technology, as well as computer games. So I focus my time playing computer games, listening to music, and trying to make money doing that. So it's, it's great if you can find something you love. Really How long have you been uh, in venture capital and investing? Sure. Um, for 17 years. Long 17 time. years. Yeah. And the other reason that I really wanted to have you here is because you're not just a venture capitalist and investor, but you've been an entrepreneur yourself multiple yeah. times around. That's right. That's so right. that really helps. Like He'll be able to give you great feedback today. Um, okay. And uh, in addition to that, talk about this uh, VC network. Yeah. And uh, the other one, the YVCA. Talk about what, what your role sure. is with that and what you do. Yeah. So um, I started an, an organization about when I got into venture capital 17 years ago um, with a mission statement of, of social networking among venture capitalists. Because networking is really, really important. It's critical to our industry. We share deals among different venture capitalists. And also, we network among entrepreneurs to figure out what they're doing. And we may not invest in them today, but we may five or 10 years from today. So it's really important to, to build that network. Um, I organize events, which I love doing. So it's a passion of mine. I do it on the side as a side job, but it's really fun. I just organized an event today with um, the San Francisco Giants. So we're hosting nice. a playoff game, which is great. I can't send the invites out because they haven't set the game time yet. So, and the game's on Monday, so like, I need to figure this out quickly. Um, but I won't have any problem filling the box. So I have sponsors pay for the events, and then it's free for the participants. We get together, we network, and the sponsors who serve who are service providers like investment banks and law firms get to know the venture capitalists. So it's a lot of fun, and um, it sort of satisfies that urge of mine to, to plan events. And Phil has just a measly 1,000 venture capitalists in his networks. There are so, a lot. Of, yeah, not, uh, small connections right. here. Right. You know? The attention <laughs> Silicon Valley is sort of the hub of of venture capital and technology because great companies like Google started here and many others and universities like Stanford. So we're in the center of the universe for venture capital and there are a lot of them here. So it's great to work with them. You're not too shabby of an athlete either. I like to, uh, yeah, I like sports, definitely. <laughs> so I- um, Shameless bragging. No, so I, I, uh, I've been a runner my whole life and, um, and I, I, I ran track and cross country in high school and college. I ran for Nike after college. And then when I moved to Northern California, with the outdoors and, and all the trails, I got into ultra marathons, which is a race over a marathon in distance. So anywhere from 50K, which is 31 miles, to 100 miles. Um, I did a 100 mile race uh, three weeks ago, and <laughs> it took me and just- And you're walking. I'm walking. <laughs> how long did it take you? I thought it was gonna say how long it take to recover. It took about three weeks to recover. <laughs> um, the race took 30 hours. Oh which my is, gosh. It was at, um, there was 26,000 feet of climbing, it was at altitude in the, in the Wasatch Mountain Range of Utah. 
And um, I, I really think that running is, and, and you know, a, a parallel to business. I'm actually giving a TED talk in a month about this topic, and um, there's a direct correlation between how hard you work and the success that you have. And you know, there's times when you want to give up, and you know, just it, there's so many different levels of similarity to business. Um, but it's it's just part of my personality, you know. I just so when you're in the hundred miles, when is your highest like want to give up pain point? Yeah. At what roughly what mile does that kick right. in? You know, it's the same as in a, a short track race or a hundred mile race. It's always the last twenty five percent, the last quarter of the race. It's just the hardest, right? I mean, you, I'm sure a lot of people have you know, been athletes in, or are athletes here, and you feel that. That's the point where you just, you know, your mind says, back off. And it's funny because your mind will play tricks on you. A name will pop into my head that I haven't heard of in 20 years because it's trying to distract me from the pain. And it's just so much about persistence. You have a goal. You want to set your goal. You, you have a plan. Follow your plan. You might have to adjust it along the way and change things around, but it's really all about just following that goal, following that vision. And uh, my, my goal was to finish in under 30 hours, and you get a special belt buckle if you do that. That's I was actually 29 hours and 47 minutes. I wow, knew. that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. But I knew, I knew where I wanted to be and, and what I had to do, and I did it. Wow, so, but when you're like at your, at your toughest moment, where you're yeah. just like, I cannot do this. I mean, you yeah. have not achieved all the success that you have by giving into that pain. So what do you tell yourself in your brain and the reason that I'm asking him this is because there are going to be some points in your Defy journey when you're starting your business and you're just not getting your customers as easily as you want to or whatever, and you're going to want to quit. You're going to feel similar types of pain, maybe not physical pain, but in your brain. And your brain's going to start speaking negative language to you, right? Like quit, you can't do this, this is too hard. How do you, what do you say to yourself or what do you do to drive through the hardest pain? Yeah. So it happens, it absolutely happens. Um, there are times when you say, oh my God, I have 60 miles to go or something crazy or I fell a few times in the race, footing's bad and wow. um, you can get injured real time. But I always think about the ultimate goal. And this is the same thing when I ran businesses on my own. Pretty much every day you have highs and lows, the highest highs and lowest lows every single day and multiple times a day. And the only thing that kept me going through that period was I want success. I just visualize success and I want to get there. And I said, I'm going to do what it takes to get there. And it's the same thing in running these extreme races or running a business. Um, you just have to know it's going to happen and you know, you need to get there. So it sounds, I'm, I'm hearing two things here. One is acknowledging that that pain point is going to come yep. and just saying, yeah, I'm going to get there. But then the second is making sure that you know the vision where you're going. Absolutely. So how would this apply to you guys? How would you, like with your business and where you want to get, what would that look like? Any of you? Not all your hands up at once or anything, yeah. Well, it feels like you got some work to do and that when the time comes when it feels like you're getting nothing out of it, you need to just press through it right. because there's a, a end to it and it's a better end. Okay, many of you, because you haven't started doing your actual business planning yet, we're gonna take you through a whole business planning like workshop where you're gonna set milestones and you're gonna wanna celebrate those goals but right now you may not even know what that end goal looks like. You knew that it's a hundred miles, so. Yeah, and I've, ta I've talked to other people, I had mentors, and I knew that this would happen. So that was absolutely helpful as well. Okay. And I, listen, I've run a bunch of hundred mile races in the past, and there have been times where I've had complete system shut down, I've had to be medevaced out and get an IV in my arm. So I've been through that, and I, you know, I didn't want that to happen, and, and so this race, I did different things, you know, I, I kept my heart rate at 150 to 155 the whole time. I knew that if it was too high, it would hurt me, you know, 10 or 15 hours later. Um, there are so many things that I've learned from the past and, you know, it's such a, it's a learning problem. You're always learning. Always. So pacing yourself mm -hmm. for the long haul too. Um, but entrepreneurship, the journey that you're about to start here is not for the faint of heart at all. Uh, so you better know that that negative talk is going to come and especially for many of our EITs, you know, how we did the uh, step to the line, like what are the beliefs that are owning your mind right now? If you don't start working through those, they will come back and they will conquer you and they'll conquer you at the worst times when you're already down, your values will kick you. I want to talk more about your success and, and uh, some of the great things that you can impart to us from that. Sure. But I want to start by talking about some of your biggest failures. So can you talk about... Uh, either per personally or professionally, 
like the suckiest failure that you've ever experienced yeah. and what you learned through that, what you learned and how you're, how you're where you are right now. Right, exactly. I like the way Kat phrased that. So let's talk about your successes. But first, let's talk about your <laughs> <laughs> um, You know, I think, I think uh, I've learned so much from failures in the past. I would say the biggest failure that I've experienced, I was part of a partnership and been in venture for 10 years. And at one point, my partners asked me to leave. And they effectively fired me from a business that I loved. And I said, what am I going to do? This is my life. Right, I've dedicated everything I have to this. How long ago was this? This was about seven years ago. And uh, you know, it was a really hard time for me personally. What I did was, I said, okay. And the reason why this happened was, I was I'm a very strong-willed person. Um, there was one person within our five-person partnership who sort of ran the partnership. And we were you know, at odds together for reasons that, you know, I, I thought he wasn't pulling his weight, but what have you. So anyway, he sort of coalesced the group and said, all right, Phil needs to leave. I basically said, look, all right, fine. I'll play by your rules. I'll, I'll work within the system that you've created. And I effectively did that for two years and bided my time and waited for the right opportunity for me to branch off out of my own, take what I learned, and start my own business. So I had joined this partnership out of school, learned everything about venture capital, and then left and started on my own. That was tough. I mean, it's hard taking direction from somebody else. Um, you know. Being within a company where you don't agree with 100% of everything, I still love the business. I said, look, I love venture capital. I love what I'm doing here. And you know, I can work within the structure that you guys have created. So I did that for a few years and then said, OK, now it's time to do it on my own. Um, since that time, they had asked the person I wasn't crazy about to leave. <laughs> and then they asked me to come back. But I said, look, I've already started my own business. Mm. I think it's hard. You, know, you really need to follow the rules of the, of the structure that you're in sometimes. Actually. Not to veer off the no, topic, but some of the best advice I heard was recently from Elon Musk, who is probably one of the best entrepreneurs of, of our era. He started Tesla, started SpaceX, and he started Solar City, three you know, multi-billion dollar companies. And he said, um, look, school is great. He's a big fan. But in life, if you want to succeed in business, find a mentor or someone you can learn from, and then read as many books or read, out, read about as much as you can about something you want to get into, that's where you're going to learn the most. Hmm. And so, um, you know, I'm not sure how that related to where, where that's I was. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, really, I'll keep, I'll keep yeah. rolling with this. What, yeah. what is a book or two that you've read that you would say you guys should absolutely read this that should, would shape the mind of an entrepreneur or yeah. character? Yeah. I mean, I think um, Walter Isaacson's book on Steve Jobs was in, very inspirational to me. I mean, there's a guy who started a new industry in computing, we're here at Google today. Um, he was fired from his job. He was asked to leave Apple, um, and he rebounded from that. He started Pixar, one of the best movie production companies ever. Um, started another computer company, but then took over Apple. Um, it was very inspirational. Um, not necessarily a how-to book, but more of an inspirational book. Uh, I actually think some of the best resource books out there are from a local company, Nolo Press. And yeah. you, get, you may use them yeah. in your coursework, but really, you know, sort of. The basic things that how to incorporate a business or how to do um, set up a contract, a simple contract. You know, those are things that, that I recommend to people all the time. Yeah. Um, Something yeah. I'll highlight about Phil's experience that he just shared is that seven years ago it felt like his life like blew up. Yeah. And many of our EITs are, you know, they're like 30 or they're 45 years old or whatever it is, and they're like, I'm starting from scratch. Like yeah. I just got out of prison or whatever. So. Uh, it, this happens even to people who have major success. Even very, I would say that a lot of people, the way that they get successful is by putting themselves out there, willing to risk failure. That's right. That's right. Actually, there's some great resources, not just in books, but on Twitter. So you know, we met on Twitter. Mm -hmm. which is great. Yes, we did. I love the Twitter sphere. <laughs> I've got 35,000 followers uh, at San Francisco VC. It's my Twitter handle, so you should check mm -hmm. that out. I have a lot of tweets about entrepreneurship and a lot of infographics. One of those infographics talks about what is the profile of an entrepreneur, and um, you know, it's it's typically somebody you know in their late 30s, early 40s. It's somebody who has experience, who knows the highs and lows in life, and they go off and do something on their own. So I would I would recommend if you're going to read some resources, some of those infographics are really I think really helpful. I want to go back to your, some of your earliest entrepreneurial okay. experiences in life. So put yourselves sort of in their minds. They've right. been entrepreneurs just selling illegal products. Sure. Um, but now as they start their journey with legal entrepreneurship, 
Yeah. Tell us about some of the earliest businesses that you started and some of the obstacles that you hit and how you overcame those. Pick yeah. any one of your first yeah. businesses. I think that one of the very first ones, I was, um, this gets back to my gaming uh, example, and it's a little geeky, but I played Dungeons and Dragons when I was a kid, very geeky, but, um, but, <laughs> but I liked it, and I played just for a few years, maybe a year, but, uh, <laughs> but I, copied, I copied these modules, these books, and I sold them to people in school. And I didn't think there was anything wrong with it. I didn't know it was copyright infringement at the time. <laughs> no one said anything. Except the principal said something when he found out. And he, he, there was a, a school assembly. I, don't, I can't remember. I was maybe seven or eight. And I can't remember if it was about me or if it was like included in the whole topic. But he, he used the word entrepreneurship. That was the first time I had ever heard that word. And he said, school is not really a place to be an entrepreneur. I don't necessarily think that's true, but it wasn't a place to sell yeah. you know, illegal copyrighted material. That was my first <laughs> <laughs> uh, Yeah. So the biggest and obstacle is he told me I couldn't do it anymore. <laughs> and then you went from there to, you also started a company in the athletic space. I did actually, yeah. Well, that wasn't my, my next, Later. Yeah, 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 exactly. That was in school though. So, base, so I was um, on the cross country team and um, we needed to raise money for school uniforms. So I said, well, you know, running tights are sort of a big trend. This is sort of in the late 80s. And um, I said, what if we silk screen running tights with a school name on them? And so that was really popular. I found a silk screener in town and worked with him to create a formula. And we were able to create some. It was super popular. And I said, you know, this is a good idea. I think, she, I think this can be taken to another level, you know? And I could sell this at other college campuses. So I started to... Um, I took some of the savings that I had and I made a few batches and I made them for some local universities like Syracuse University. I'd go there at night, we'd go door to door in dorms and um, you know, sell so my you, Wait, hold on. You weren't too proud to go door to door no. to sell. Exactly. You hear that? Okay, that's Absolutely, what it takes yeah. when you're a startup entrepreneur. Right. I was going door to door in running tights. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> Creepy. <laughs> exactly. There's college. Right? So, um, but it was, you know, I would basically, it, my cost, it was $10, and I would take 25 in in revenue, right? So my gross profit was $15. I didn't really have any other insurance costs or, or rent or anything like that. So I made $15, which is a pretty high margin. Mm -hmm. um, and so I said, all right, now it's time to really, so I went to the head of Charles. I sold along the Charles River. I went, um, I sold eventually to 250 college bookstores and coaches. Um, around the country, and in two years, grossed about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. I paid for my college as a student. Awesome. That's as amazing. Student, yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, what is what was as an entrepreneur one of your like most heartbreaking and disheartening moments? Yeah. Um, so when I was in business school, another school of business at you know, Harvard had, Business School. I did. Yeah, I went, to, I went to Harvard Business School, which was an incredible institute. It was great. I really enjoyed everything. They, we just filmed Harvard courses that they're going to be watching. Yeah. We took our guys up there. Excellent. Yeah. Um, so I started. I, I bought a company for about fifty thousand dollars. It was a baby shoe bronzing company which is, you know, a little bit different. It was an opportunity that I had. I knew about somebody who was selling the business. I had always been interested in manufacturing, and um, I wanted to make it a much bigger company. And, and we had about 300 independent salespeople around the country, and, uh, and they would go door to door selling. If they were in a very wealthy neighborhood, they would sell bronze baby shoes for $350. <laughs> if they were in a not so wealthy neighborhood, they'd sell it for $75. It was totally at their discretion. We just sold it to them. And, um, you know, the business really didn't go anywhere. I mean, I tried a lot of different things, and it just wasn't something that, that you know, was going. I, I, mean, I ended up selling it back to the original owner for about what I paid for, about $45,000. Mm. So I lost a little bit of money, lost some time. The one thing I learned was, <laughs> if I were to do it again, this was in 1995, I would have taken a course in um, programming or spent some more time at MIT Media Lab and gotten to know programmers, because I had a lot of ideas. I just thought, because I, I wasn't a programmer and didn't know how to code, that I couldn't start a web company, right, or an internet company. That was the time to start an internet company. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in retrospect, I would have said, go meet some of those engineers, take the idea, hire them, and start a business in the internet, in a, in a better area. So, I think I was sort of overwhelmed with my idea of owning a business yeah. versus what the best use of my time was. And I, you know, that was certainly a lesson learned, for okay. sure. Great. Yeah. So they're all startup entrepreneurs. Yeah. You see a lot of startup entrepreneurs. 
what is your best advice to them? They're like in ideation phase right now, yeah. so they, they're not committed to yeah. an idea. I mean, some of them feel very committed, and sometimes we tell them that's not a very good idea. Right. Uh, what's your best advice to our startup entrepreneurs? Yeah, so um, the way we think about entrepreneurs and startups, we look at four different basic things. You know, we look at the entrepreneur, and um, do they have what it takes to be successful? Um, do they have experience in this area? Do they have the drive? That's the first thing, and probably the most important thing. The next thing we say is, you know, what market are they in? Is there a market opportunity? This is a growing market. Like the baby shoe company was not a growing market. The internet was a growing market. Um, then the next thing is, what's the product or the service that they offer? Does it solve a problem that people want? Is it valuable? Um, and the final thing is sort of the, the deal, the transaction, you know, are we paying too high of a price? Does it make sense? Can we make money on that? Um, so those are the basic things. I think as an entrepreneur, um, you know, it's all about those relationships. You know, if, you, if you're looking to raise money, try to, try to work with somebody who is a friend of a friend or maybe knows somebody or maybe was funded by somebody else. Um, those relationships are really important. When you have that meeting, um, it's really important to be professional. Um, professional in every part of your life. If somebody says no, which they probably will multiple times, um, they may say yes later on. I mean, they may refer you to somebody else. Mm -hmm. Don't burn any bridges. Be very, be very professional about this. Um, you know, somebody asked me earlier, how do you gain confidence to talk in front of other people? And um, I think it's really important to practice. You know, sit in front of a mirror and practice what you're talking about. Because once you have confidence in what you're saying, you can then speak freely and be more personal, make eye contact, and, and really engage your audience. And that's super important. Um, and obviously, what well, we talked about, don't be afraid of failure. Um, so when, when I left that venture fund and started a new venture fund, yeah. we went out and pitched college endowments, institutions, state pension funds, people who manage a lot of money, who gave us that $100 million to invest. And we talked to 150 funds wow. over the course of a year and a half to raise money. Um, it took a really long time. Um, but we knew it could be done, and we knew it took a long time, and we just kept going meeting after meeting, and you never really knew afterwards, you know, were they going to invest or not. Um, but I think if you are going to raise money, one thing I would say, ask people during the meeting, what did you think? What do you think of my company? You know, don't just say, okay, great, we'll follow up later. You know, try to engage them. Is this something you'd be interested in? You know, what's the next step? Yeah. You know, and I think that's a really important thing. Only one out of ten people that, that talk to us sort of take that approach, and I always appreciate it. And it does urge me, people are busy, right? And it urges you to take that next step. Uh, it urges me and really and try to engage with that entrepreneur. Even tonight, we're going to talk about what, he's, what he just said, which is closing the deal. And some, I don't know where people get these sales stats, but they say that of people, of salespeople, only 46% of them ever make an ask at the end of a sales presentation of sorts. So at Defy, we are going to be closers, and we will teach you this, it's so important. When you said that the number one thing is the entrepreneur, yes. we're big on this at Defy, and some of our EITs sometimes are like, why do I have to do all this character development work? Like, what does this have to do with me being an entrepreneur? Yeah. Um, but from working in, in uh, venture capital back in the day at Summit Partners, I remember that when we looked at backgrounds or if they had any traits that were, if substance abuse or anything, like, pfft, it was gone. Yeah. So um, can you talk about some of the, on the character side of entrepreneurs, what are some of those negative characteristics? Like if, if an entrepreneur looks for money and they show up late to mm -hmm. the meeting yeah. or uh, anything that is a deal killer and, what, and on the negative side and then on the positive side, character traits that you look for yeah. as an investor. Yeah. Well, first let me just say, I think failure is seen as um, not a badge of honor, but a, a piece of experience which is really important in Silicon Valley. Because you know, there's this adage of try, fail, try, fail, try, fail, succeed. And so when you fail, you learn from that and you grow. Now, not everybody that you work with is going to see your failures as something they want to work with, or they may see it as, wow, here's somebody who has learned from their failures and actually wants to take the next step. So that's just, you're going to find people who have two different points of view. The person who says, you know, I really want to work with you because I like your attitude, those are the people you end up working with down the road. I think that's great. Um, in terms of personality traits, uh, yeah, I think it's really important to be engaged with your user, um, be very respectful and be professional. I think professionalization is so key in every single facet of your life. And, um, and not just in business, it's in every relationship that you have. And people, 
respect it. So many of these things are common sense, but when you hear them from Defy or, or people who have done it before, you start to realize that those are things that we, you know, I should be doing as a part of every part of my life. You know, um, and you mentioned some things earlier on. You know, um, those are you know the way you write, the way you, um, the way you talk to people, the way you respond afterwards or follow up. Those are all positive things. Um, I think people can tell if you're distracted or if you're not, if you haven't practiced, or um, the way you dress. I mean, so many things matter in a first impression. When we look at a company, if we invest in a company, we're going to work with them on the average five to seven years. It's a long time before we actually get our money back or make profits. But when we first meet with somebody for an hour, that's when we have to decide whether we want to take the next step. We talk to about 1,000 companies a year and we invest in 15. So in that hour, really in the first 15 minutes, we know if there's a connection. So that first impression is so important. You need to have those character traits we talked about, practice them, and really, um, really nail that first meeting. It's so critical. Yeah, so you're going to get a whole lot on that. That's why we will have literally eight hours of amazing training from the Emily Post Institute. Um, oh, it's right. everything like sure. there's a two hour dining course. I've eaten at a lot of nice restaurants in my yeah. life, mm -hmm. but like what to do when you have three forks and all these like mm -hmm. spoons and how to put the napkin in your lap or not, right. when to get up when, to go to the bathroom, like all these little things because people do judge a book by its cover. It's natural, yeah. everyone does it. Right, so. well, if you, you just have a few data points when you first meet somebody, so all you can do is exaggerate them over a five to seven year period. That's all you really can go on. Yeah. So if there's a few things that they're uncomfortable with, they say, well, uh, you know, this isn't going to work out. Or if they're pretty impressed because, you know, you come in on time, you dress well, you're respectful and talking, you're prepared well, the materials you have look good. Those are things that all matter. And mm -hmm. then you exaggerate that and say, okay, you know, or expand and say, this is really somebody who I can see working with. So uh, I said it was the last question, but I lied because you're so great that I have one last bonus question for you. You, you could be a million places right now, anywhere in the world that you want to be, and you're choosing to spend your time here investing in our EITs and defies a little off the beaten path. Why did you say yes, and what, what do you, why do you believe in second chances? Yeah. Well, first of all, as I mentioned before, I'm a huge fan of giving back to the community. I used to run a nonprofit um, where we volunteered every weekend in the community, focused on people in their 20s in professional organizations. This is in Los Angeles called the LA Street Project. I love doing that. Um, I love opportunities to give back, and I think what you guys are doing is great. I really think that you know, getting a second chance is critical in life. Everybody deserves second chances. And um, sec a second chance to start a business and to make your life better is phenomenal. And I think I'd be doing exactly what you're doing if I was in, that, in your shoes. Um, so I'm just, I'm really just honored to be here, honestly. I'm really, I'm really excited for you guys. We're honored to have you. Please yeah. give it up for Phil. Yeah.